today's talk is going to uh, start off with some just things to think about, and then it's going to get into um, a lot of uh, the sort of practice planning and, and um, a lot of really good drills that I think you guys are going to like. Planning your season. Um, let's just jump right into it. So the, the first thing I, I want to really think about is, and I want you to think about is, you know, who are you as a team? Um, you know, at this time of year, we're, we're, we're like constantly uh, on, on pieces of paper and writing down, you know, who your attack's going to be and your midfield and your defense and what looks you want to run and all that kind of stuff. And, and you have things that you want to do. You, you know, you, you always wanted to run this offense. You wanted to learn the Syracuse motion offense or you really want to do some inverting. And, you know, the truth is, you know, you can do anything you want, but it's really smart to uh, think through who you are and why you're doing what you're doing as you're going into a season. And, and by the way, let's all realize that our kids are going to develop and change. And, you know, what we thought we were going to be, we might be a lot better or not as good, and you just never know. So let's take a look at a couple things. One is face-offs. You know, whether, you, whether you're going to be on the uh, – the receiving end of a lot of face-off wins or the receiving ends of face-off beatdowns is going to make a difference as far as how you want to play. And I'm going to give you an example. Brown University, a couple of years ago, uh, you know, they, they're playing this up-tempo game. We're, we don't care. We're going to shoot the ball. You know, any shot's fine. You know, that works great when you win, when you have got maybe the best face-off guy in Division One lacrosse. And, and on top of that, they had one of the best goalies. So understand that if you're going to, if you really want to play fast and push transition, that it's really hard to do when you're not winning face-offs. Look at Virginia last year. They played the same way, and they had no face-off guy. They didn't have great goaltending. And so I think you have to really think hard about your abilities to win face-offs and how much you can dominate when you start thinking about exactly how you want to play. Um, goaltending, same thing. Um, you know, what, what kind of goalie do you have? Do you have a great stopper? Do you have a good stopper? Do you have a not a great stopper? Is he an athlete? Um, is he good in the clearing game? I'm going to give you an example of something to think about here. In 2008, um, uh, we had a team that went to the NCAA tournament with a 48% with a save percentage goalie. Uh, we did not have a great goalie. He was a terrific kid. He was a great athlete. Um, and we used him in different ways. If we had played a traditional kind of slide and recover, packing in defense, giving up outside shots, uh, he would have really struggled. But instead, you know, we said, hey, we have an athlete. We're going to pressure like crazy. We're going to use him in double teaming situations. Uh, you know, red dogs on the end line. We used him to jump. Uh, you know, if we jumped the pick behind the net, he would um, he'd pick up the slip. Um, he, he literally could step out of the cage um, and make plays as attackman might, you know, if attackman got a quick rollback coming around the cage, we would come out and he'd make that play. Um, so when you think about your goalie, it can, it, it can sort of dictate a little bit how, how you want to play. Um, you know, how's your defense? On ball, off ball, with ball. Those are the three sort of um, criteria that you want to evaluate your guys on. On ball. Are, are, are you, do you have great on-ball defensemen? Obviously, um, you know, if you do and they're not as strong off the ball, then, you know, you still have to play team defense because they're still going to dodge your shorties. But, but maybe you can, maybe you, you know, maybe you can have a defense that doesn't have to slide a whole lot. And Loyola went to the NCAA tournament and won the championship in 2012 with a team that, that played great. You know, they had Hank Hawkins on their shorty position and they had Scott Ratliff at pole and, they didn't have to slide a whole lot, and they had great sticks. On the other hand, if you have got a team that, that's, you know, really smart and a lot of, you know, not great cover guys, but really smart defensemen, then, you know, that's, that's, that's like a – that's a joy because you get to work with them and really develop ways of playing great team defense and supporting uh, and, and, and sliding and recovering and double teaming and the things you can do. Uh, make it a lot of fun. Uh, do you, what kind of personnel do you have, you know, long sticks wise, you know, do you have more guys that are like long stick middies? I'll give you an example there. This past season, I coached with uh, Hauntstown uh, with the Atlanta blaze. And we, you know, we kind of looked at our defensive personnel and we were like, you know, we think that we've got, we think we've got more kind of long stick middies than we do close defensemen. So we double pulled as, as our base defense, we double pulled the wings we got good at learning how to double pull, you know, you know, when the ball got down on defense 
And, um, and we also figured, you know, we, we really think that generally speaking, uh, a team's second, better, second best midfielder is usually uh, a tougher matchup than the third best attackman. We also had shorties, you know, when you start looking at your shorties, we had shorties that were like really physical and, and, and tough and strong and, 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 and really good at their holds, but they weren't, you know, we didn't have three really fast guys. So we probably would rather have them down on an attackman that's going to try to beat you with quickness and post-ups um, rather than getting a guy that's just going to like, you know, pull you out and, and, and blow by you. Um, you know, so when you think about your team defense and how you want to play, you know, I, I do think that, um, in the end, uh, I'm a big, um, I consider myself a, a disciple of Jerry Byrne. I think he's one of the best um, coaches in the game and I've studied what he does and I'm going to share that with you guys over the course of this whole program. Um, but I, but I, I don't think that you have to try to like, you know, be somebody you're not, but I do think the principles of foundational uh, skills such as, you know, posture and stance and approaches and, head turn, communication, um, need to be worked on no matter how you're going to want to play defense. And then once you start to figure it out, you can say, hey, you know, maybe, maybe we want to play, you know, more of an adjacent sliding scheme or a crease sliding scheme. I do think you'll make, you know, with how short high school seasons are, you probably want to keep it um, simple to begin with and then be able to, like, layer on some, some tweaks. Now let's think about the offense a little bit. You know, on attack, do you have – you know, do you have a guy that can, like, be a real matchup problem? Uh, do you have somebody that the other team is going to really worry about? Because if so, that's great. It gives you an opportunity to, um, to, to play some big little games and bring shorties back there and really put the uh, defense in a position where they don't want to switch off your big little action back there. And that could be a huge advantage uh, for your team. And, and if you really want to run a bunch of big little stuff, but you don't have that attackman that's – like that scary, um, you know, I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, but it makes a pretty big difference when teams are saying, hey, we're not going to switch and we're going to now have to like, you know, fight through or get under and all these things. Um, you know, what kind of lefty situation do you have? That's going to make a difference on, on you know, your man up and, and kind of like what looks you're going to want to put in there and, and how you're going to figure out your personnel. I mean, it's kind of funny, you know, Denver doesn't lack lefties. Uh, but they love putting a righty up in the top lefty shooter spot on man up quite often. Uh, so there's different sort of things to think about there. Um, and, um, and the other thing I want to sort of talk about is as you're thinking about your personnel, think about your midfield. You know, I, I think if you've got great depth and you've got, you know, great middies and great attack, then, you know, listen, you can run anything you want. Um, but at the end of the day, I think that you just have to have a, 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 I think you need to load up your midfield. Um, and if that means move, move an attackman up to the midfield so that you've got three really, really dangerous guys, I, I would seriously consider doing that. Um, I, I've done that over the years. And, you know, listen, there's, there's a lot of different ways to skin a cat. Um, I do think that if you want to be a big time team, you have to have some attackmen that can dodge. But but if you don't have, if you don't have three middies that are going to absolutely be able to like blow by shorties, you know, then it's going to be a problem for you to create offense and draw slides. If you're not drawing slides, it's going to be really hard. Um, so I would generally want to like load up a midfield and, and, and really put teams in a position where if they don't double pull us, it's a big advantage for us in high school you know, you're going to get double pulled, but not to the same degree that you're going to get double pulled in college. And so therefore, I think it makes a, a, a it's a pretty smart move to consider loading up that first midfield line with so much talent that if they do go ahead and put a, a pull on the obvious guy, you've got two other guys that are going to be really, really good for you. Um, continuing on here, um, you know, do you have enough depth in your program to go ones versus twos in practice? That's going to be an important question to ask as you're trying to formulate your practice planning. Because if you do on both ends, it's awesome because you can really, you can really go with two ends and you can have your, you know, your first uh, defense going against the second offense and they can give you looks and, and vice versa with the offense. Um, you know, it's a nice, it's a really nice luxury, but if you don't, 
Um, you know, you have to really think about what you're going to work on and what you're not going to work on. Because if, if you only have really enough guys to go at one end most of the time, then, then you just can't cover as much uh, ground. Uh, simply put, you know, when you have two ends, the offense can work on their looks while the defense works on theirs. And if you have to go at one end, then, then something has to give. I, I will tell you that, you know, the offense is, is what's going to have to give. You're going to have to, like, make sure you're prepared defensively for sure. Um, so think about that. Do you have assistance that can take a side of the ball? This is huge, too. Um, you know, you, you, first of all, if you don't, you need to develop them. And you need to like really try to you try to work with them, and hopefully they're gonna you know get on some of these uh, some of these um, uh, webcasts and, and stuff because this is the kind of stuff that is is gonna help. I mean, for example, defensively, I went made it a point last weekend. I literally locked myself in my office and I made seven or eight videos about the Jerry Byrne defensive drills. And um, you know, you can get your assistant, if you, it, to, if you can get an assistant to learn how to run those drills perfectly, uh, or vice versa, get them to run a lot of the offensive drills that I'm going to be showing tonight, it's going to make a huge difference for you because you really need to spend some offense defense time during practice, um, at least from the skills perspective that it's going to get you prepared. You know, do you have an assistant coach that can take care of working with your FOGOs and your goalie? That's going to be huge too. I mean, if you want to do it, great. Um, but, but I think that one of the things in, in last night, Stags talked a lot about this as the head coach, you really need to be able to spend some time before practice starts, just talking to the guys, get there 15, 20 minutes. If you're not in the building, you know, if you're, if you're a teacher at the school, then, you know, you, you see them all day, but if you're not, you really need to spend some time. And it's so awesome to have some assistants that can go and get the face off guys out there 10 minutes early every day, get the, uh, get the goalies out there and get, get them warmed up. Um, I ask you, and, and I'll challenge you to be able to coach both sides of the ball. You need to look at that um, really, really seriously. And it's not that, it's not that you don't want to have a, you know, if you're the offensive coordinator or you'd like to coach the offense, it's not, it's not that you, you want to not have a great defensive coach. That's not the point. The point is, is with, you have to know both sides of the ball really well in order to give yourself the look you want on offense. We're going to talk about that, you know, in a lot of different scenarios. But at the end of the day, everybody, your defensive assistants need to be able to know both sides of the ball to give themselves the look they want. And too often, you know, too often I see coaches, you know, working on their offense, but they're not actually scripting the defense that they're going to see. So, therefore, they're not working on what they're going to see. Um, you know, are you a veteran team or do you have a lot of new kids? Are you, are you a new coach? You know, as, as you're, are you the, you know, first year head coach with this program? Uh, do you have a lot of new guys or veteran guys? It's going to make a difference because you just have to really limit how much you're going to try to, if you're new with a program or you got a lot of new guys, um, it, it's, it's going to be really difficult to try to, to, to try to throw too much stuff at them. You're probably better off really focusing on, on doing fewer things, but uh, doing them really, really well. Um, I want to talk about this concept of shot selection for a second. I, I can't stress enough. Shot selection will win and lose games for you without a question. You, everybody needs to understand what shots you, know, you want out of them and what shots you're going to be okay with them taking. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, a bad shot that's caught is a turnover. And it's not just a turnover where it's a loose ball and maybe somebody gets it. It's a turnover that's going to come right down your throat. I'm, I'm, last year, last summer at the MLL level, you know, you take a bad shot, it's going to be a goal. Like, no question. There's, it's coming down your throat like none other. And at the high school level, it, it, it's pretty bad too. Um, and I think that you just need to define and make sure that every single kid is very crystal clear on, on what shots you're okay with. And, and, and you should really look at all of their shots. Like some kids, you know, have a really good time in room shot, uh, but their, their shot on the run because there's so much whip in their stick is just terrible. And the goalies catch it every time. And some kids, even if they're right-handed, they, they got a really nice like lefty snap on the run, but their righty shot on the run is just a, it's just a, at their feet, the goalies just always saving. And I think it's important that, you know, we want to develop our kids to have a repertoire of shots 
Uh, but we really need to make sure we're not taking shots that, that, that we're settling for. It, it will absolutely win and lose you games. And the last thing I want to talk about is, you know, who do you need to beat? And what do they do? Because I would tell you that if there's like a, you know, one team or in your conference or a couple teams that you like, you just know you got to beat, then I recommend that you start thinking about that and that you probably put some of the stuff in offensively for yourself that they run so that you can be used to that over the course of the season. All right, so let's look at the components um, of – of really what you got to work on. Um, and the reason why I put this list here, and there's other things on the list. I mean, there's some special situations and there's, you know, obviously a lot of components within the components, but I put this on here because, you know, you need to think about how you want to install the things that you want to do that are all based on who you are and, and who you want to be based on who you are. And so per component, Decide what you want to have installed and by when. So you're going to look at the first game and say, all right, you know, by the first game, I, I want, I need to have these, I need to have, you know, I need to have a basic transition offense and defense in. I, I want to have um, our base motion offense in and I need to have a big little and I want one set play. Team defense wise, I need to be able to have, you know, our basic you know, slide and recover scheme of the way that we're going to be able to play. Riding wise, you know, we don't have a whole lot of time to do it, but I'd like to have, you know, a, a two down ride and make them throw the long pass. Clearing, you know, we, we're, going to, we're going to play a four across or a three across one deep, whatever it is. And, and you need to look at all of these, all these facets. And then you got to, you got to look at when you want to have them in by. And then you're going to have to count backwards. So if that's in two weeks, and that means that you've got, you know, 10 practices and uh, two scrimmages before you open up, then you're going to have to start thinking about your practice plans and what you're going to do based on that amount of time. And generally what happens is you're like, oh, crap, there's no way I can get all of this in. So I'm going to do a little bit less uh, because I, so I'm not going to have that offense in until two weeks later. But the, the problem with not doing this is if you just take it day by day, um, you'll, you, you probably won't get as much in as you could have had in. And I, I think it's really important to, to think a little bit longer term. It doesn't mean that you can't make adjustments and that you won't make adjustments because you definitely will. So this is a really important exercise, even if you alter the plan. But, you know, by the, game, by the first game, uh, by, the, by the fifth game of the season, what do we want to have in? What do we want to be able to do? And how can we plan that out based on the amount of practices and games, you know, that we're going to have? Um, and, and, and this little um, how to leverage lesser games. And, and scrimmages, I would count in this too. A scrimmage isn't a lesser game necessarily by definition – uh, of, of the opponent because it could be a great opponent, but it's not a game. And so you can work on things. You can say, all right, I'm going to make sure that we've got our deep zone ride ready to go after we have played the scrimmage. And I know we'll have that in by that time. Or you tell the coach, Hey, let's work on our rides and clears a little bit, you know, before our scrimmage starts so that you can like check that box and know that you've got some of that stuff um, covered. And then the last thing is, is, you know, your pregame warm-up. You know, everybody gets a different amount. When I was at Mountain Vista last year, you know, we only had 25 minutes. Um, you know, when I was at Denver, you had as much as you wanted. So you, you, you basically, like, made sure you worked on stuff. If you go to a Notre Dame game or a Denver game, watch their warm-ups. There is no question in my mind that part of their strategy is we're going to get better at lacrosse today in warm-ups. And that, over the course of 14 or 15 games – is going to add up to a lot. So take your warm up seriously and think about, okay, well, you know what, we're going to shoot, you know, I know we're going to get like eight or eight minutes of shooting in and we're going to get a bunch of shooting reps or, you know, whatever it is that you want to work on, you can think about. And, and, and obviously you're preparing to play, but you do want to be able to have, uh, you know, that, that sort of thought process going through your mind. Let's talk a little bit about a technology plan. This is really important because there's things that you can do that'll make a big difference for you. So this private Twitter account, 
go on to the um, onto the micro trainings, and I, I did a little five or six minute video on this. Um, this is the greatest thing. These kids are on their phones all day long, and you can communicate with them, and they'll actually look at it. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go over this too long right now because I, I it's in the micro training. But trust me when I tell you, it was one of the best things that I did with with uh, Mountain Vista High School over the last two years, and and then with the Atlanta Blaze. And Dave Huntley really was a huge fan of it. He thought it was the greatest thing since sliced bread. Uh, you know, game film. How are you going to like break down your game film? How are you going to distribute it? Are you going to have meetings? You know, back to the private Twitter. It is. It, it can work a lot better to be able to send clips to your team rather rather than just try to get them into a big film room. Um, practice film. I'm not sure how many of you guys film practice. Probably not many because I, I did a survey on this and there was only about 20. 25% of the people that film their practices. But I can tell you that there is no greater opportunity to learn than from practice film. Think about the value of game film. Think about how much you learn about your players, how much they learn about themselves, how much you learn about yourself, and what you're doing. And then look at, think about that in the context of practice. And it's absolutely as powerful with the difference being you can work on whatever you want in practice and in games, stuff just happens. So you don't really know, you know, what you're going to see in a game and whatever you get, you react to, and it's, it's a great opportunity to learn. In practice, you can actually script out what you're going to work on. And the same thing happens in practices as games. Uh, if you, you know, let's say you put in your zone defense, you're like, man, I felt pretty good about our zone today. And you go watch it. You're like, oh, my God. This zone is terrible. So, so just understand that any feeling you had from practice or games is usually different on film, and there's a huge value there. I don't know if you guys use crossover or huddle or what you do, um, but um, I think that there's definite value in the statistics and sort of looking at, um, looking at the, the cut-ups. Um, we'll talk more about stats as we go along. Um, and then last year I did experiment with this pro program that, that, that allowed us to have uh, managers do live stats and we could actually look at game film cut-ups during the course of games. It's a pretty awesome idea. We, we used it, um, but um, I would tell you that um, of this list of important things, I would rank filming practice number one, game film right there with practice film and the private Twitter as something that these, those three are, are absolute musts. All right, let's talk a little bit about practice philosophy. Um, you know, having a written practice plan and, and having it distributed is really important. That was one of the beauties of the private Twitter account is that you can do that. And the players would all be excited to see what they were going to do today uh, to have your coaches know what's going to be, be going on is huge. Um, no surprise. Uh, you know, you want to have an up tempo practice that you're going to move as quickly as possible uh, from one drill to the next. Try not to spend too much time talking. Reps, 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 we all know this. Um, there's a combination of you know, quantity of reps and quality of reps that's gonna be really important. And, and uh, back to the practice film thing, problem is you don't really know what your quality is unless you film. So the film will give you the quality control. And by the way, you, know, you might be at one end and you might have an assistant at the other and he might be new you know, his development is, is, is critical to your team's development. So we want to we wanna make sure that, you know, we have a little bit of that quality control there. Uh, killing three birds with one stone is a, is a, is a, is a concept I always talk about. And I want to give you an example of what I mean by this. So pass down, pick down three on twos. Um, it, allows, it allows us to work on a lot of things. Um, it is the exact um, sort of reads for the ball carrier it, that you would use on man up in any kind of two man shallow cut situation where you want to like kind of fake a pass back to the, to the picker. You want to step into the gap. If there is a gap, you want to pump ahead. If the, if the picker, if the, if your man fights through the pick, you know, you're going to throw back. If it gets stuck on it, you're going to step into the gap, you know, that type of uh, opportunity in a three on two drill to, to actually completely like lock in the reads and the skills of a, of your man up. And 
is, is a huge benefit to that three on two on top of the fact that you're obviously working on, you know, passing, feeding one more, finishing all kinds of fix. So whenever you can sort of realize, Hey, we are actually working on our, you know, four on three fast break defense here while we're doing, you know, this other drill or whatever it is, it makes a huge difference for you. Um, so we want to try to think about that. Um, and, 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 and on the other side of things, there's times when you just can't afford to water anything down. Um, and I talked about that last week and I'll continue to with some of the defensive stuff. I mean, if you just need to get your approaches down, then, then you need to get them down and don't worry about doing 10 other things, you know, while you're working on your approaches. So that's a real art and it's an important one. Uh, the priorities, skill, team defense, team offense, in that order. If you're not skilled enough, you better put the time in or you're not going to win a lot of games no matter what. Next, you got to be able to defend. You can't give up terrible, uh, you know, transition goals. You need to be able to play smart team defense and just not give up terrible goals there. And then the third piece is team offense, probably starting with clearing because, you know, at the end of the day, you know, if you, if you turn it over, if you fail to clear the thing, you know, if you're 12 out of 22 clearing the ball and you lose by two, you probably lost because you didn't clear it. Um, competition in practice, Jim, Jim and JC talked a lot about that last night. I've got some really cool ideas on that. And then the last piece is if you watched any of the um, Jerry Byrne um, defensive drills I put together, practicing things at half speed is, is, is really important. So we've already kind of gone over these categories. Um, we're almost getting into the video here, so just a couple more minutes. But you really got to ask yourself this question is, you know, can we catch and throw well enough? Um, if not, you, you're just – if the answer is no to this, you, you just got to put the time in. There's no getting around it. Uh, I had to do it when I was at the University of Denver when I first got there. I had to do it um, with Mountain Vista High School when I first got there. And, and, and you know, putting in 30 to 40 minutes, of which 80% really needs to be two- and three-man stick work, is just going to be – you know, you're just not going to get to where you want to get to if you don't have that foundation. Um, if that's the case and you're just not that skilled, you got to scale your passing. you got to scale it through doing more GB – Oh, scrambles, GBO, uh, ground ball offense, where the ball hits the ground and you're moving it as fast as you can and you're moving it again. You know, putting in Claremont rules um, in your drills with a two to three second rule with the ball and the give and go. Um, you, you're going to have to limit how many different things you're going to try to do um, offensively, defensively, and then the special teams because you, you're just not going to have the time to do that. And it just doesn't matter how good your man up schemes are if you can't throw and catch as well as you want to um, and so you know even though I'm telling you you might have to spend 30 to 40 minutes a day on on just passing and catching you still have to put the time into your individual offense and defense because the individual skills and the development of the individual player is what's going to help you continue to improve across the entire season and never lose sight of that you might win a battle if you're more prepared for this one particular game, having some new scheme or shut off or whatever, junk defense or some whatever, but you're trying to win the war. And the war is the war is like the season and the war is how many seasons you're going to be there, you know, because you want to be able to like, just keep getting better over the course of time. So um, this is the practice plan template that I have used. And, and it doesn't mean that I don't change it. If you won't, of course you will. And I do. But, but this is kind of how I look at it. And this is with a team that, that does catch and throw on the run well. Um, and so the 10 minutes of stick work, like I told you, 80% of the time I'm doing, I'm doing two-man and three-man on the run stuff. And I might do more like 15 minutes of that uh, or 20 in, in the very, very early season. Um, the GBs, I, every day we do some ground balls. And uh, I, 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 five minutes is, is, is about what I allocate to it. And um, I'll get multiple groups, you know. So we're not going to have one line, one big group of guys doing one-on-one -on -one ground balls. We're going to do, you know, three groups if we're doing one-on-one -on -one ground balls and two groups if we're doing two-on-two -two or two-on-one -on -one ground balls. Our offense-defense work, I really believe, is – that 25 minutes, and I'm telling you, sometimes we would do 35, 40 minutes. 
that is where we developed the, the, the ability to be super skilled and smart in the way we did things. I'm going to go over all of this stuff in a little bit. You know, transition wise, um, you don't necessarily have to do uh, it, it, you know, legitimate transition, you know, fast break stuff every day necessarily. You can if you want to. I usually did the, my transition stuff mostly for the sake of the defense to make sure we were going to play decent transition defense. And I would do, you know, a couple times a week of transition drills, and then we would do GB scrambles to try to work on playing fast and moving the ball. Um, but I really believe that our stick skills in all of our small sided offense defense work was what really uh, gave us an ability to be really good in transition. Um, but it's not that I don't love transition because I do. I just think that it, there's diminishing returns on working on it all the time. It takes a while. It, you're not getting reps. And at the end of the day, um, you know, you're, you're just not going to – people don't win championships with transition. You know, like I said, Brown got to the Final Four that one year. Um, but but, but it, was, it was a perfect storm of Tawaraton winner on attack, you know, unbelievable polls of the best face-off guy and goalie combination in, in, in recent memory. So um, don't get sucked into believing that transition is going to like, you know, win the, your, your, your championship. It, it'll win games for you and you want to be good at it. The O drills and the D drills, that's, that's our, our three on three or four on four or five on five or five on four, where we're really working on, you know, being able to play great team defense. And we always want to try to get something out of that on the offensive side. The six on six variations piece, I'm going to go over that later. Um, so we'll get into a little bit of detail on that. And ride clear, I wouldn't necessarily do it every day, but, but I think that you, you got to make sure that you're competent in your clearing in particular. Um, and then the man up, man down piece, um, again, depends on your level of stick work. You know, if you're not that skilled, then you should be putting the time into your smaller sided stuff. Um, so this is the, uh, the last, the last drill before we get into our, the last uh, thing here before we get into our drills. Um, actually, we're going to move right into it. So three man passing at speed. You guys have seen this. Um, and I just going to keep continuing to emphasize it. You have to do this drill. Um, and how you space yourself out is going to be really important. Be 15 yards apart. Go fast. One cradle, look up the field. Crank passing. You've seen this one too, and I'm going to show you again because it's so important. This is uh, five minutes. You, take, you do this five minutes, uh, you know, and you do it for uh, maybe twice a week. And you just get used to catching and moving the ball at maximum velocity. And it's, it's an unbelievable developer for your players and your team. This is a drill that I, I, I stole from Messi that is just kind of like you're in a diamond shape. And it helps you throw balls that are somewhere in the 10 to 15 range. And it helps you throw lead passes to people. Um, it's, it's a great change up. Um, this drill here is an awesome drill too, in which you're going to basically just, this is, this is when you're not that, that skilled of a team, you're going to do this. You're going to have three kids running around, throwing the ball, you know, ahead, throwing it behind, working on different skills. Like this is like a pull pass here. Um, you can work on, you know, sticks to the inside, sticks to the outside. And, you know, here you see face dodge. Um, you're going to see, uh, watch this, uh, the, next, the next player does the look, look back, face dodge over, come back. And you can, like, really work on a lot of different skills in your circle passing. Throwback line drills. Um, you're working on question marks and reverse pull passes. And, again, this is a great way to introduce the skills to your team that you need to be able to have. Here's a rocker and a question mark. And there's just, you know, endless variations of MJ moves and different types of rockers, and different throwbacks, money passes. Um, and this last drill, this is what I let the guys do when they're, when they're basically like kind of beat and, uh, and they're, and we've been running around a lot. It's the day before a game and, and, and it's kind of a little bit of a lower key drill, but I do have some parameters. I really want them to catch it on the move. I want them to split with their feet moving. And I really want, I want two balls going at a time. 
and I would really like it to be where you have um, where you have a smooth split. And so hopefully most of these guys are doing a decent job of keeping their feet moving and splitting. And over the, and, and then we'll also work on you know rolling back. And and here our emphasis is you know you got to like roll back as if the ball was. Um, the momentum of the ball was helping you make your, your spin. As you can see that the momentum of the ball with most of these guys is, is actually like, you know, it's not literally making them spin, but that's how I want them to kind of spin and protect their sticks. Um, ground balls. Um, we talked about this the other day. I can't stress it enough. You got to get the ball up off the ground. You got to move it as quickly as you can. And if you do that, you're going to get the defense is going to be out of position. So when you pick a ball up, move the ball off the ground as quickly as you can and move it again. There's no substitute for this. If you're not doing this in your ground ball drills, you're missing the opportunity to make your, your team a lot better. So that's going to be incredibly important for you. Same thing here. I've showed you this drill before too. Move it once, move it again, and move it fast. Fire the ball. Don't worry about it if they drop it. Let's get the ball off the ground as quickly as we can. And don't forget, if the defense picks it up, they're going to work on going back to their goalie. Now, I don't show this example here, but your ability to pick the ball up defensively and clear it up the field is one thing. But your ability to throw it back to your goalie and clear it is, is another really important part. So let's talk about this. We're going to spend a little bit of time on the individual and small group offense. He's shooting, dodging, big little three-on-two, small-sided games. You know, we shot a lot with our program. And, and, and whether it was shooting or finishing, we worked on it a lot. Here, we're doing a crank passing four-corner shooting drill. We're, all, we're just cutting diagonally. Everyone is going to make a diagonal pass to a diagonal cut. And what I'm asking them to do is throw the ball really hard. Um, and you can really whip it at the lower guys. The higher guys that are cutting down, it, you, it's a little bit harder to throw it quite as hard because you might, you might actually injure them. But for the top guys, they can absolutely, like, wind up at the low guys. And to be able to catch, I mean, Hunt's always said this, catching is the hardest skill that there is. And if you want to be a great shooting team, you're going to do this. Now, you'll notice on the left side of the screen, you can see guys that are on another cage. So, we only have about eight guys in this. Uh, we only have about eight guys in that group, maybe nine total. Here, we have a variation in which you can see I'm demonstrating it right now. It's the first time we ever did this, but we're working on dragging. So this is like a really important man up skill where we're going to work on dragging and then feeding off the drag. The drag, what is that? It's a back pedal, and it's a back pedal that's going to allow you to pull the defense get your hands a little bit free. So it's the same drill we were doing as far as four, as far as four corners. Um, but you can see we're working on these skills of feeding on the move. So later on, I was like, hey, drag it, drag it, great. Then I wanted them to carry and throw it. So they're carrying on the run going forward. Um, and then I had them crow hop and absolutely just rip it at each other. Um, this is a... Uh, a uh, bling bling shooting is a, is a shooting drill we do generally in which we simply just pass the ball. We have two lines and you can see we don't have a lot of kids in line. We have another goal that you can't see right now. And we're going to throw it across and, and either shoot it off, off the catch, split and shoot, split dodge, roll back, you name it. We're going to work on all of our different shots and dodges. This drill in particular is called, um, low high wind up and so what we're trying to do is wind up low lift up high and then hammer the ball high low high wind up is literally one of the best techniques that i've ever come across for being able to shoot well watch this right there and, and why is it that this is such a great technique it's a great technique because multiple things one when you when you lift, when you start low and lift up, you're going to hold the goalie up, number one. Number two is it allows you to have a little bit of a hitch in your stroke. You see how there's like a, there's, you know, if you shoot right through your front foot, it's kind of easy for the goalie. But when you bring it up, and there's a little bit of a pause 
as you transfer your weight to your front foot, it makes a huge difference for you. This last example is a pretty good one, low, high, and then the rip. You can shoot leaners or pull shots out of this, and it's great. Um, here's an example of where we're working on the same drill. It's bling bling shooting, but now we're coming down the alley and we're working on our teeter totter, which is lifting your hands up high, and our leaner where we put our head down low. So, what is this? That's a really nice looking teeter totter right there. If you look at his hands, he does a really super nice job. This kid's at Air Force right now. He lifts his hands up, he's holding the goalie up. And he puts it low, and there's no way the goalie's going to touch it. He puts his head down a little bit late. So we're trying to get a sense. I, I, and for me, guys, I'm a, I focus on deceptive shooting more than just about anything, which is why we're using tennis balls here, so we can shoot it hard and get in close and get in tight. Um, but I want our, our shooters to be deceptive shooters because, in the end, it allows you to have more – you, you can, there's more margin for error that's acceptable when you're deceptive because the goalie's going to get right out of the way half the time. Whereas if, you, if you're going to telegraph your shots, you have to shoot it harder and you have to shoot it more accurately. And so it, 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 it's, a, it's a philosophy and we work on it literally all the time. Wind up screenshots. We talked about this. I've mentioned it to you. Uh, you need to use tennis balls in this drill or no one's going to want to play <laughs> defense because they don't want to get hit by a shot. But when you shoot these shots, um, they're oftentimes – screenshots are oftentimes – oops – a better shot than what you would have shot had you, had you made a dodge. And what I mean by that is when you look at this kid's shot right here, Look where he's shooting from. He's 10 yards. He's shooting around a man. And if he would have, say, face dodged underneath, he might have been shooting with less angle. Um, it's also all you got to do is shoot some screenshots, and your hitch and goes and face dodges will be there like you read about. So let's make sure we think about this. You've seen this slide again. Uh, the whole point here is, look, we got to work on a lot of different dodging skills. And we want to be able to scale it. We don't have time to go one at a time. So we're going across the field here working on, we're, we're working on uh, hitches and rollbacks. Hitches and rollbacks, hitch, hitch, rollback, getting that feel for it. You go back and forth with this, you know, two or three or four times. You're going to, over the course of a week, you'll learn how to have some serious, uh, some serious moves here. Slide dodges, again, this is just an example of our offense-defense time. I'll have two cages going without a question on this. As you can see, there's only eight guys at this cage. There's eight at the other cage. You need to make sure you have multiple cages and multiple creases, and that this is going to allow you to work on, to work on whatever dodges you want. And here we're working on our slide split. We want to – Brundy works on I learned this from Stephen Brundage. They split dodge underneath the hands of the of the uh in the stick of the defensive player it's like an underneath split allows you to get real nice and close and be uh, really deceptive obviously when you get that close to somebody it's very hard for them to play it because they have no cushion so um, we're going to work on our wrong side of the field one-on-ones where we're a lefty coming down the lefty alley. How are we going to get our shot off? So we work on our belly out move. We work on our double rollback where if you don't have the angle you want, roll back into the middle of the field and gain a little bit more angle so you can shoot it. We're also going to work on our S dodges. Like, like sometimes you're going to get played like this right here where the defender's taking away your strong hand alley. So how are you going to get it? you got to be able to say, hey, guys, just S dodge him, which allows you to dodge to the inside and still be able to get your strong hand. One-on-ones um, -on for mechs. I don't care if you're a midi or an attack, man. We do this against our shorties all the time, and we really want to be able to do this. Um, we want to have two basic moves, a V-cut move, where it's just uh, you know, running in the shape of a V-cut, so getting your strong hand, and, and then using that V-cut to set up your split dodge right here where you fake it and you get your split. If you, can, if you can work on these moves, you know, if you can't dodge people, you're not going to create the offense you want to create. This is an interesting matchup. Carter Zavitz from St. Catharines, Ontario versus Latrell Harris. 
This kid Zavitz is sick, man. Did you see that play? He goes to Princeton. Um, and uh, this kid, uh, Latrell, actually lived in my basement for a year. Um, and he, he's in his second year playing. He, um, he played – he was in Collins, uh, on Collins' team, my son's team. I was coaching that team. Now he plays for the Toronto Rock, and he was second in the running for the uh, rookie of the year. So watch this low high wind up, though. Watch this. Low, high, and then he sticks a leaner. Um, this kid, Latrell Harris, is a beast, though. Um, and then we're going to work on our um, – we need to be able to work on our um, – oops, hold on, guys. Did not mean to do that. Um, then we're going to be able to work on our – We're going to be able to work on our tight one-on-ones right here and really be able to um, work on the, the part of the one-on-ones that are tight to the cage. I know we've seen some of this before. During our individual offense time, we're going to work on our, um, we're going to work on our uh, two-on-twos like crazy, Def just shorties against shorties. Notice that we're scripting the defense here. This is really important. Um, we have the defense playing no switch. Do you see this? This is, we're telling our defensive player on the ball, you have to go under the pick. Why? Because this is what we're going to face. We knew that they're not going to want to switch. And so, therefore, um, we needed to be able to work on our two-man game with the no switch. And that's what happens sometimes. Guys, like, you know, are so anticipating you going under the pick. They're, they're going under the pick. They're anticipating you use it. Um, that was poor pick placement right there. Um, as you can see, he gave him a perfect angle. If this pick had been set on this side of the cage, uh, it would have been a lot harder. So we work on this. And the other thing this does for you is it really helps you work on your shooting. It's, 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 it's the kind of shooting when you're coming around is the sort of the fade shot shooting techniques that are really, really uh, important for you. Um, I think you get so much value out of doing these. They're one-on-ones, they're two-on-twos, and they're shooting. Sometimes we will use tennis balls, but look at the reps that the guys are getting. And we're going with two cages on this, by the way, always. And that, that shot opportunity right there, this shot happens all the time. And, we'll, we'll, you know, I'm going to teach you guys later on exactly like some great techniques for this. But the, this type of shooting happens all the time. And so I really love it. We talked a lot about this in our last couple of webinars, but working on your midfield motions. This is all shorties again. Hey, let's work on our, our three on two regular. Um, let's work on our, let's work on our three on two uh, power one, you know, where we pick across and we're working on the motions there. We work on all of our motions in our offense defense time. Um, so that was the offense piece. Defensively, you got to work on your breakouts, your three on two situation, D goalie D and your uh, and, and, and the four on three version of that, which would be D goalie D versus two riding attackmen, and then your one defender in the middle. I'm going to draw some stuff up with you on this for you guys. I'm not going over it now. I'm going to put together a clearing plan for you guys, but just know that you know these defensive that, that during your defense time it's skill time as well. So it's going to be ground balls. It's going to be long passes. It's going to be um, skeleton transition defense. What does that mean? Well. Your guys need to know exactly where 10 yards is, okay? You got to, like, be able to get in the hole and set up in a break situation and be able to pick up at 10. You need to know what it looks like looking at the restraining line from 10 yards because you may not be able to turn around and look away and see how far you are from the net. So getting, getting into 10 yards is going to be really, really important. Obviously, you got to work on your two-on-two -two stuff behind and practice setting picks against each other and no switch and switch and how you're going to do that. And then, obviously, all the Jerry Byrne drills um, are really important. I don't do a whole lot of one-on-ones. I like doing one-on-ones more like this, where the guys are bouncing and getting in, working on – that's like working on their cross-check hold, working on their – you can do that drill with V-holds. You can do that drill in so many different ways. Um, I'm not going to go through too many of these drills right now because I did all of them in the micro trainings. Um, but drills like this, you know, you can see that we've got multiple drills going on at a time. Our defense is at one end. This guy's working on, we're working on cylinder drill here, which works on off ball posture on and on ball approaches. 
we're, we're, we've got volume man concepts going on and just look at the posture. I mean, you know what, if you can get your defense to play like this, you're going to be such a better defense. So much of it is just being in a good posture. I do want to talk about this little drill though. I didn't put it into the micro training, so I'm going to have to. What this drill is, is a simulated three on three drill where we're working on dodge, slider, get ready, uh, second slider, drop in and, and, and prepare the spider, the spider ring call, and then, a th and then a throwback, and then a pick, pick communication, switch decision, slide decision, and then look at number five busting his tail to get in after his man set the pick, or after he switched, um, after he switched off, he's getting in to cover up because we had a slide decision there. We're going to go over this drill in great detail, but going through these types of walkthroughs of, of talking through your picks is what you're going to do on top of your stick work down at that end. Uh, transition wise, um, worry about your defense first. Make sure, you know, before you get too happy about your fast break offense, make sure you're picking up at 10 yards. If you pick up at 15 yards, your goalie's going to be raking the ball out. There's no way the point defenseman can get down to the lefty from 15 yards against a good team, but he will get down there from 10. Um, and um, there's some great other drills that I want to put up. There's a, there's a Notre Dame full field drill, but it was going to be too hard for me to show you guys here, so I'm going to put it into a micro training. I think you guys are going to like it a lot. But, but if you don't have enough guys to run full field drills, and last year we didn't. We didn't have a big enough team. We could do it, but we didn't have a lot of depth. So we went, we went one direction quite a bit. And so we would just roll down maybe a four-on-three, maybe a four-on-three with a trailer. Um, you know, what you, why do you want to film practice? Because here, here's a veteran def defensive player coming out, running out, and then turning his back and opening up the lefty skip. Had he had, he had proper technique on this, he picked, he's at 10. He's, well, he's basically, let's call it close to 10. But if he shuffles over and then he opens up into the passing lane, this team, you know, the offense doesn't get that opportunity. So, obviously – you know, it's your offense is going to get something out of it, and hopefully they're not going to like throw the ball down the side, you know, too often. I want to I want to go over this one situation in particular that I that I always do that you need to do when you're doing your transition drills. We split we split the guys. It's a four on four situation. They're coming down with about fifteen or twenty yards apart. We've got a pole coming down um, with the ball. We've got a shorty getting in. And what we're going to practice doing is picking up the ball with the point and getting the point defender to get this mini into his man. This is a critical situation in four on four and five on four that you need to be able to do because if both guys come down and play this ball, if the, if the defender has to stop the ball and the midi's right next to him, then they're going to have a, what the, they'll have a four on three fast break out of the deal. Uh, however, if you can get really good, at getting your midfielder to the point in this, in this drill, whether it's five on four or four on four, it's going to make a huge difference in your ability to uh, stop, um, stop goals from happening. Um, we already talked about the nine lines. We do this quite a bit. It's an awesome to drill. Don't forget the value of your defense, getting ground balls and going back with it. How many, how many turnovers do teams have every single year because a defensive player picks the ball up and feels like he has to turn it up the field when he could have thrown it back to somebody and we could have had the clear. Team offense, team defense drills. Um, this is critical. You got to, your attack has to be able to handle the ball. Your defense has to get used to playing and putting, applying pressure. Your attack should learn how to do all of their three man, um, all their three man plays, their picking plays, early offense, and, and they need to be able to handle the ball against pressure. And uh, you want to be able to get your throwbacks. You want to be able to balance the field. This really gives some your um, both sides of the ball an ability for them to to play. And so what I would do is I would have the the, the middies down the other end while I had the attack and D at this end, and and we would bang this out for probably. You know, once once a week, maybe five or eight minutes. Here we're working on our on, on our three man plays. 
generally speaking, guys, when you want to run a three-man play, fake an on-ball pick first. Okay, fake an on-ball pick and then make your way into the crease and then set one on the inside. Darn it, I hate when I do that, guys. I do that all the time. It's so annoying. Um, let's just fast forward here. Fake, so there's back to the play. Um, you you want to be able to fake a pick on the ball and then slip out of it and then dart out. And you got a, all these little plays that you're going to be able to do, whether it's pick inside, fake the pick inside, throw the ball. Um, there, there's a little flip, two man, and here we are hooking around, looking. So there's a lot of stuff that you can work on. Um, this is in the micro training. We talked about this also, the, uh, the ability to, uh, to, to do four on four pressure drills. Talked about this in the webinar. I'm not going to go over this now, but it's in the micro training. This is in the micro training also, but this is one of my all time favorite drills. This is a four on four, big little behind. And what it has is the elements of slide decision. So we've got a big little here. We've told the defense, no switch. We've got a second slider. We've got a crease man and a slider. We've got a midi out top at the restraining line. We're making him stay wide. And we've got a second slider. The defender makes a slide decision. And he says, find one. The man on the ball is running in. And now he has to slide immediately. That happens. In fact, anytime there's, anytime there's a quick slide to an invert and you're recovering in, if they skip past and dodge, the man who's probably sliding is that guy. So let's watch this one more time. There's more scenarios than this that happen. If you don't slide, then you know, the, the, the original slider has to get back out to it. But this is the kind of dynamic play that's going to make your team a lot better. I did a micro tra tra training on Big Little Skip Survivor. It's an awesome drill. Five on five drills. I'm a huge believer in these because you can work on so many things. Number one, it puts more stress on your defense than six on six does. Three poles and two shorts out here. We're working on our three man midfield motions. We're running that blue devil look. We're throwing back and we're dodging. We're going to get a nice little dodge slide recovery. We got two attackmen behind that are basically working um, as if it was Syracuse type motion. Now we're coming right back across over. We're setting a quick pick. And because it's five on five, it puts more stress on the defense. However, we're still feeling like we're working pretty well on our offensive looks. When you do four on four drills, you're just a little bit limited. You know, it puts great stress on the D, but you're limited in terms of exactly the, the stuff that you can do. Uh, offensively. So five on five kind of gives you this happy medium that I really love and I recommend doing a, a ton of that. Uh, five on four drills, obviously they're, they're amazing for your defense. You know, you can see right here, our defense is putting no ball pressure on and they're letting guys feed. So, you know, whoops. if you don't, if you're going to let guys feed and they're skilled, they're going to tear you apart. You know, look at this. This guy sticks up in the air, and we're feeding it backside, and, and, and there's no problem. So your five-on-fours, you have to figure out a way to get ball pressure. Um, I did a micro training on five-on-fours as well, and you're going to see this next clip here in which um, this is an awesome defensive drill that's in the micro training. It's five-on-a-die setup, two-on-two setup out of the offense. And look at the backside players getting in to help on the crease. You know, I love this because it just makes guys learn how to get in. Now, obviously, in our micro training, we talk about, you know what, a little ball pressure goes a long way. Um, because if we didn't have to recover all the way down here, it would have been a lot easier for us. But a nice rotation, and this defense plays this pretty darn well. So I'm really pleased with this rep here. And I want you guys to know that I learned this from watching Jerry Byrne. They did this drill all the time. And it really teaches your backside uh, guys to get in and cover the crease. And if they do skip it through, you can still rotate, as you can see there. Six on six drill. This is a shed buildup. We talked about the shed buildup drill with a three on three. Here it's six on six. So let me tell you what we were going to be facing. We're facing a, an offense similar to how Duke ran theirs. So it's like a one four one. It starts with these guys on the wings, but then these two low attackmen come into the crease. It starts with, you can see basically a, a carry, a throwback, 
a pick, kind of similar motion to what we were working on in that three-on-three -three drill. But now what we're trying to work on here in half speed is the transfer of responsibility from the initial slider. So there's a crease man who's going to be saying, I'm hot. You'll see it right now. He's a shorty. He's on the crease. I'm going. Rizzo's going. Rizzo's going. But now all of a sudden the ball gets low. And instead of having Rizzo go all the way down there and be hung up on a slide while his man is, is, is floating away, we're going to transfer that responsibility to the clear through man. And we're practicing that in this drill right here. So we're practicing switching picks and sliding out of our midfield when the ball is out top. And we're also working on transferring slide responsibility to the clear through attackman when the ball comes back up. So you're going to see it happen this time pretty well, I think. All of a sudden, oh, I'm going. Now Rizzo picks up his man. And by doing this stuff and scripting out our opponent's offense, and because we've done these drills so many times, we're starting to get pretty good at understanding how to put other people's offenses in. And we're working really half-speed stuff here. And it's going to be amazing for your defense when you start adding that in. Another six-on-six -six drill that we do is what we call an invert drill. And I just, like, line up. I put all the middies that are going to invert. I put them behind the net. We set it up. And we rep it out fast. We're just going to, like, you know, play it till a shot or a goal. Of, you know, hopefully not making stupid turnovers on bad decisions. But we're not going to, like, play six on six out of it. We're just simply going to work on our inverts. The other thing I want you to notice here in this invert practice is that um, this is a, there's a lefty behind the net. And we're forcing him to his right hand. Why? Because we know they're going to force here, right? So you might as well work on it that way. In about five or seven minutes, we can rep out enough inverts that, that, you know, if you work on the whole thing of jogging it behind and one at a time, it takes forever. So we're trying to maximize our time and practice working on our, our, our invert look. This is the very look that I put in the micro training, actually, that uh, single invert. It's a really nice look. Uh, you guys have seen this before. This is all of our offense, actually, um, down at one end. But this is a three-on-three three plus three-V-0 when we're working on – this is a six-on-six buildup drill. Uh, we're doing it with all the defensive players. Maybe at one end we'd have a shed buildup going on, uh, and at the other end we've got our three-V-3 three three plus three-V-0. Um, but this stuff is, is great, great stuff. Um, six on six for points, um, a great drill. Um, it makes it competitive. One point for a goal, a half a point for a clear. Two points if the defense gets a double team. And one point if the, de if the offensive player does, players' middies don't get back in the hole and the defense gets a fast break. Um, we sub after two of these things happen either after two goals, two turnovers, or two clears. So let's just say your starting offense is against the starting defense. And they turn it over quickly. And then somebody turns it over again. Oh, you're, you're done. Uh, the second offense is in against the second defense. Um, let's say the next time the second defense, and, and then they get back in there, the second offense is in, and they score a goal. So it's, it's, now it's one nothing second offense. And then all of a sudden, uh, the second offense, shot, save, fast break. Now it's one-to-one -one because the second offense's middies didn't get back in the hole. Um, and after two clears, you know, you sub. After two goals, you'll sub. This really teaches the kids how to value the ball. I'll put this in writing for you, but I'll tell you, six-on-six six for points is so much better than just running six-on-six six when the guys are just throwing the ball all over the place. And you're just, like, losing your mind. Um, so I would highly recommend you put something into this. And the other thing this allows you to do is play out your clears, which is going to be really, really important for you. So I love doing this. It's, it's at its best when you can have the first offense against the first defense and the second offense against the second defense. If you don't have enough guys for that, then have, then have it be five on five for the second offense against the second defense, or four on four for the second offense against the second defense. So it's great drill. Um, end of game stuff. You know, how do you practice 
getting the ball back when you need to get it back at the end of the game. This is something that needs to be practiced, you know, at least once a week for about five or eight minutes. And this is, this is how you got to make sure they completely understand the, the order of things. But the first thing you need to do is lock off the shorties. And generally, one shorty will have the ball. But if no shorties have it, then it makes it easier for you. Don't let the shorties get it. And then when the ball gets behind, you know, you can go to work on your double. However, we know that they're going to get the ball to a shorty and they're going to take it behind the net. Why? Of course, because it's harder to fast break from there. So they take a shorty behind, the other shorty's locked. Then we'll flush that short. What that means is that we will slide out of the crease and we will just say, find one, find one, find one, Johnny, find one, and he'll get out of there. And then now we'll have a, a pull on the ball. We need to make sure that we're locking the other short because if they just throw it right to the other short, then we're going to have to take the time to flush it again. But once we have the ball behind with a pole on it and we've flushed the short, now we've got two shorts locked off. Now we need to make sure we have good ball pressure. Don't play soft on him and let him move the ball around. Get on his hands. He doesn't want to dodge to the goal. If he does, that's good for us. Put pressure on him. Do not let him throw passes. Ball pressure, imperative. Next step is the goal. He's going to grab the nearest defenseman and say, hey, John, go get it. You got it. And he's going to block that guy. If you don't have ball pressure, he's going to be able to throw it to somebody that's including the goalie's man, and we can't have that. So the ball pressure is really important. But the defender who's doubling doesn't need to go too fast. He can, he can, I don't want to, he doesn't want to take his time too much, but he wants to take his time enough that he's going to, with good ball pressure, he can communicate with his teammate and say, okay, get ready to stay right, get ready, stay right, stay right, stay right, and you can get the double team that you want. And then the last thing is, because you've been doing your double team drills anyways, you're going to be great at jumping picks if they set one. So end of game stuff is going to be really important. Um, the last couple things here, rides and clears. Um, you know, nobody loves spending a ton of time on rides and clears. Um, so let's just make sure that we do a couple things here. Um, for one thing, worry about your clearing first. You can do skeleton clearing like this, but always have a plan for what you're actually working on. Here, we're working on specifically, we're working on a breakout. Where you always got to sub your guys out and sub guys on when you're working on your clearing or it's not really working on it because in the game you're going to sub guys. And what we're working on here is we're in an open clear and we're working on getting the ball up to the midi on the bench side who's covered by an attackman. For us, we always say, we say, hey, who's got the mic? You know, we use that term football terminology. When we know that there's going to be an attackman that's not going to go over, it's not match feet, we're going to identify as a group where that guy is. I got the mic. I got the mic. Then we're going to work on getting the ball uh, to that guy. Sometimes it's going to be um, from the near defenseman. Um, on the next clearing situation here, you're going to see that we're working on the high and away pass from the far defenseman to the mic. Now, I didn't love that pass because it was longer than it needed to be. We need to make sure that we are running the ball out of our box anytime we're going to make a pass. Um, and, you know, he knows this too. I mean, I, it was frustrating sometimes. Um, but as JC said last night, that would be my fault for not getting him to understand the importance of all that. But we would work on all three of these guys, the, the defender, the goalie, and the other defender, being able to throw it to the midi who has the mic. And like I said, I'd rather have them run it up a little bit to be able to do that. But we're working on a, a specific clearing situation. Um, here's another clearing way that we work on our rides and clears. Um, I want you guys to notice the uh, ball movement here for a second. So it's whites on offense. They're going to ride. And uh, grays on defense. They're going to clear. Tell me if you, if you notice anything funny about the ball movement. Well, it's called air ball. I always go air ball when I'm setting up rides and clears so that we don't waste any time. And I actually usually have the guys work on something. Like right there, they were like working on a little weave look. No, they were doing our uh, Buckeye Pairs offense look. I'll be like, hey, guys, 
run, run stack, run Buckeye. And then I'll say, shot save. And I'll roll the ball to the goalie. And then we'll work on our substitutions and we'll work on the clearing and riding. Here we're working on a match feet scenario. So match feet's going to happen to you. Um, there is no mic because the attackman's going to be following his man over. So we're going to need to run it over. Uh, could be a goalie running it over if they're locking the defenseman. It could be a defenseman running it over. Um, but we're getting into it and we're, we're working on our specific situations. And we won't do this more than like, you know, maybe three, four, five reps. Uh, we got a little air ball going first. As you can see, I think I, I yelled out, hey, run stack, run stack. So they ran stack. Uh, the, the offense, the, they're running a green look behind the net. Um, and then all of a sudden I'll say, you know, over the end line, over the end line, or shot save, whatever it is. And we're going to work on different scenarios. The reason why I like the air ball and the reason why – so that's a, that's a uh, shot save scenario. The reason why I like going air ball is because you don't waste any time. And then I can also, like, run a quick skeleton offense. And, um, you know – it didn't take us any longer because I want to get a dynamic situation going with our, uh, with our off, with our, with our guys learning how to play off the clear anyways. Um, I mean, sorry, how to ride and clear off of the offensive and defensive scenario that really happens in games. Um, guys, I'm almost done with a micro training on man up and man down. You're going to really like it. Um, but to me, man up and man down is so much about the skills. So how fast you can move the ball, your ability to fake, your ability to deal with pressure, your ability to one-time skip passes, low-high wind-ups. Um, there's, there's, there's not that many things that happen, but there's ball-side roll-offs. There's backside roll-offs. There's skip passes. There's, there's cuts. There's wing roll-offs. There's drags. The way you throw the ball is always like crank passing. And the throwback ability, the skip pass, the one more, the drag, the step in, the one more, the screenshots. These things are, 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 are the pieces and parts that make a great man up. And we have to figure out how to teach these things, how to be able to look off, how to be able to handle and kick, how to skip rifle balls uh, at, your, at, at your teammates. Look at the faking here. This is incredible faking. I mean, how does Stan look walk in that way? Well, it's a four-man rotation. He's faking everybody around. Watch Denver. Denver is phenomenal with their little four-man motions. Look at those low guys pinching. Those low guys are sneaking so hard. And, and when you're backside from the ball, when you're two passes away, your backside, look at this backside sneak here from Denver. These are fundamentals. You know, you, your low guys have to sneak. And then there's motions. You know, here there's a lot of two-man shallow cut motions. Um, there's three-man motions. Watch this behind the net. You're going to see like a, a carry and, and a three-man attack little motion that occupies three players. And then they kick it up to another carry and a shallow cut with a throwback. Um, and then, you know, when they're playing a four-man rotation, you got more skips. Here's a three-man rotation. Um, and then here's going to be another three-man rotation. Denver's playing a five-man rotation, right? So the inside's usually open against five-man. Here, Maryland's playing their five-man against a 3-3. Three, three. Most college teams do. You guys are going to play more lock crease four-man rotations. Look at the faking. Look at this faking. Fake, fake. Step in, draw, move it, one more, skip pass, game winner, screenshot, beautiful screenshot too. Um, so, you know, all of these parts, Ohio State runs an amazing man up, the way that they bang the ball. Watch the double cuts open up a drag and a step in. You know, so all, all in all, how do we get there? It, it, it's through the drills, guys. It's through these drills. This, this flip, we showed this before, but look at the drags. Look at the fakes. I, I, honestly, I can watch. These are eighth graders from D.C. They're probably pretty good players, but you know, I can watch this all day. Why? Because it's interesting. And they're faking. They're dragging. They're drawing. Faking helps your draws and dumps. They're being creative with their passing. Um, 
Here you're going to see a three on two pass down pick down. I referenced this earlier. This is exactly the same kind of two man. If you can run these motions and handle pressure and carry and throw back and one more and finish, you're going to be able to play a good man up. You add this together with the spacing of crank passing, and you're going to be in great shape. Um, you know, you want to be able to run some flip plays on man up. We'll flip in your three on twos. Four on threes. Uh, there's, we've talked, you've seen this clip before. It's the Canadians, but there's a couple of things I want to add to this. So, so let's make sure we remember fast passing, no cradle is, 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 is an absolute must in your four on three drills. But don't forget your defense is learning how to rotate just as well. You got to get your ball pressure and you got to be able to move the ball fast. But I do want to show you guys one thing here. Oops. I do want to show you guys something that um, is a really important concept. Give me a second here. Okay, so I'm going to use my – I do this a lot. Okay, so first of all, when the ball's on this side, this guy has got to sneak in. That's a must. Has to happen. Okay? So when the ball's going down and up, this guy has to sneak right in here. You saw the Denver guys. That's how you sneak. I may, I, that's why I showed you that. Okay? The other thing I want to be able to do is I want this guy to learn how to drag. So when the ball goes down and back up, I want this guy to catch and backpedal slightly on his drag, and then he'll throw it across. But he'll be looking for the skip because that guy's going to skip in. So here's the drill before I let him score. Down, up, drag, across. Down, up, that guy drags, and he goes across. Down, up, drag, across. Down, up, drag, across. Sorry for the gross drawing there. But I want you guys to run this drill as a precursor to trying to score out of your four on three. Down, up, drag, across, and then this guy is going to sneak. And then as soon as the ball comes across, as it does, this guy will step off and this guy will sneak in. And then we go down, up, drag, across. Okay, That's one drill that you want to do. The next thing I want you to do is this. Down, up, drag, across. And I want this guy to reverse it immediately and see if this guy can skip it on the one timer. Okay, so it's down, up, drag, across, reverse it. Down, up, drag a little, across, reverse it, skip. If the skip's not there, no problem. The skip isn't there, you're just gonna throw it back. And he's gonna go down, up, drag a little, reverse it, skip. The reason why is we want our guys to be able to reverse the ball really, really quickly and look for their skip passes. Don't do this all day long. Just do it a couple times so that you get, so you guarantee a couple things out of your four on three drill. A backside sneak, a backside sneak, and learn how to drag and learn how to reverse it for the skip. Remember in the, in the, in when, I, when I showed you guys that highlight of the Hopkins guy catching it and skipping it on the one-timer? That's the reversal I'm talking about. That's the skip that I want them to be able to have. Okay. Um, so let's see here. Next, this is a drill that I showed you guys in the last webinar. If you watch, your ability to run a great man up is going to really come down to your ability to carry with pressure and make passes, carry with pressure, and either throw back, throw ahead, or skip. And so the ability to do that in this drill, whether you're doing three-man rotations, shallow cuts, any of this, you have to be able to carry with pressure and throw back, carry with pressure and throw ahead, carry with pressure and skip. The ability to do that happens in these drills. And you got to get your defense out there pressuring. So carry with pressure, throw back, skip. Um, it's going to make a huge difference on both sides of the ball for you. Now, you've already seen this clip, but this is great man up practice. If you don't, anytime you're playing a four-man rotation with a locked crease, this five-on-four drill simulates that, that exact scenario. 
And we're going to work on our three on twos. We're going to get shallow cuts out of, I mean, our five on fours. We're going to get shallow cuts out of these guys. We can get shallow cuts out of these two guys, shallow cut out of these two, or shallow cut out of those two. So we're going to work on our shallow cuts. Um, obviously, when we get the ball, let's take a look here. Um, you're going to see us doing the five on four drill here, in which um, we're looking to get the ball inside. And so you're going to see us looking for that pass right there. That's the pass that you're going to get against five-man rotations, whereas you're going to get more faking and skip passes and one mores against the four-man rotations of, of that. Um, but uh, in the end, guys, this is um, really what, what it's all about, is being able to have um, amazing um, – being able to have just absolutely uh, amazing skill development to work on all those pieces while you're building up your offense. All right, everybody. Have a great night. Send me a Voxer. Let me know if I can help you out anytime. And uh, cheers.